So um, I just wanted to, you know, give a little bit of a brief um, setting of the scene to let people know where we are with regard to the status of the pandemic. Uh, this is a slide from the New York Times that shows, uh, you know, that a lot of countries have experienced uh, a resurgence, uh, just like we have in the United States. Um, with the non-pharmacologic interventions, most countries have gotten their um, surge under control better than we have, and ours just uh, continues to climb uh, throughout the country. Again, this is uh, data showing uh, very, very recent information on where we're at uh, throughout the United States. And so you can see uh, up in the upper left-hand corner of the slide, the new cases per day, and we're averaging over 200,000 uh, new cases per day. You can see it's just starting to maybe plateau off a little bit, which I am hopeful shows that uh, people are really aggressively starting to, to distance and wear masks and uh, you know, having those interventions that we know will make a difference. Unfortunately, on the bottom part of the slide, you'll see the new deaths uh, that are reported or the daily deaths that are reported uh, uh, each day. And in general, the death rate is a lagging indicator. It typically uh, you know, takes off about a month after you start to see the cases uh, go up. And that's pretty well demonstrated here that uh, you know, cases really started to climb here in sort of early October, where the death rate started to climb in early November. So uh, unfortunately, with the cases that you see, um, we've bought ourselves an awful lot of mortality that will unfold here over the next uh, several months. And then you can see the number of patients in the hospital um, in the, uh, the right-hand side of the slide. And we've got 113,000 people in the hospital uh, as of yesterday uh, due to uh, COVID-19. Here's the heat map uh, throughout the United States. And, um, uh, you know, it's just really alarming uh, how widespread the uh, pandemic is uh, throughout the country. Uh, there's obviously some real hot spots, uh, Tennessee, uh, through Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, you know, uh, Oklahoma, the West Panhandle of Texas, Southern California. Uh, there's some real areas that are just absolutely hot on fire. But uh, the whole country is, uh, you know, red, orange, and yellow, uh, meaning that uh, we're all um, seeing a lot of cases throughout the country. Uh, coning into Nebraska, you can see that we have a number of counties that still are very much in the orange and red state, um, showing a lot of transmission in, uh, in our state. And then uh, drilling down a little bit more on Nebraska, uh, on the left-hand side of this slide, uh, you can see the new cases that are described daily. And uh, we did peak, um, you know, in mid-November and have come down uh, really um, gratifyingly uh, and luckily. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to see that. I hope that the trend uh, continues downward. I do have some trepidation with the coming holidays and uh, what will happen through mid-January because of that. You can also see the daily active hospitalizations in Nebraska. And I, I truly believe that we escaped by a whisker uh, really taxing the healthcare system uh, about a month ago, uh, where we were up uh, at about a thousand patients in our hospital, hospitals throughout the state. Uh, that has now declined to less than 600, as you can see. So those of us who are working in the hospitals uh, are, are breathing just a little bit of a sigh of relief, but you can see that uh, the number of hospitalizations far outweighs what we saw in the spring. And so the hospitals are still very, very busy with uh, COVID-19 patients. And um, you know, we're certainly not out of the woods by a long shot uh, throughout the country and in particular within our own state. However, uh, we do see a real glimmer of hope. We see a light at the end of the tunnel. And even though we're still really in the tunnel and we have a lot of ways to go yet, um, this really is the way that we work ourselves out of this predicament. Uh, we work ourselves and dig ourselves out of this hole uh, with the vaccine. And so um, I'm just really, really uh, happy and pleased uh, to see this coming out now. It really does give us a reason for hope. Now, I hope I, I don't have to convince uh, too many people in the audience that vaccines have been a terrific development and a real medical advance. Uh, on this slide, you can see on the left-hand side, the cases of measles. Uh, as we introduce the measles vaccines, the various forms of them, uh, the, the number of cases has completely uh, decreased. Um, if that was carried out uh, to the present time, and Alice may uh, want to comment on this, we unfortunately do continue to see some sporadic uh, cases and outbreaks of measles. And, 
anytime we let our guard down and don't keep a, a, a herd immunity, um, we do see sporadic outbreaks of measles in this country. And then on the right-hand side is polio. And uh, this used to be a, a yearly scourge in the summertime. Uh, parents would uh, take their kids out and uh, try to escape out into the country to try to keep their kids uh, healthy. Uh, every summer and fall, we would see outbreaks until we developed the vaccine. And you can see that uh, this disease essentially has gone away. Um, and in fact, if we could just marshal the, the forces uh, this is a disease like smallpox that we could completely eradicate from the, uh, the human population. So that's uh, something that if we can get over this COVID-19 pandemic, hopefully we can turn our energy back towards uh, getting rid of polio. Uh, the COVID-19 vaccination scene is uh, very, very vibrant. And this is an example of what really can happen when you marshal the forces of government with uh, the forces of industry and the forces of uh, scientific research. Uh, we've brought forward um, a vaccine in, in record speed. Uh, we haven't cut corners with safety and we'll talk more about that as we go on. But this uh, slide uh, shows that there's over 150 different COVID vaccinations that are in uh, one stage of development or another. There's uh, over 75 that are in human uh, experimentation and 87 that are in various preclinical um, stages. And then the next couple slides just show the, the variety of vaccines that are being developed against uh, COVID-19. Uh, the top one is the mRNA vaccines. These are very, very exciting. Uh, not new technology, but a new application of the technology. And it's very, very exciting to see these two vaccines from uh, BioNTech and Pfizer uh, coming out, as well as the second vaccine, Moderna. You can see the uh, bottom portion of the slide with viral vector, vector vaccines. This is where a, a virus uh, carries the message, uh, as opposed to the mRNA vaccines, where the message is carried uh, on a little bit of lipid. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But the viral vector vaccines use a virus to deliver the vaccine product into your body. Uh, there's a number of those that are getting close. Uh, probably the, the best one or the one that's closest to uh, being reviewed and uh, potentially coming to use is the one from uh, AstraZeneca. But you can see again, uh, with both of these examples, lots and lots of other uh, products that are being studied. Uh, Protein-based vaccines are a little bit more traditional approach. Uh, so this is generally where you take a, a portion of the viral protein. Uh, a lot of times you combine it with an adjuvant that helps your immune system recognize the protein and respond to it and uh, mount a uh, antibody response. Uh, the one that again is uh, probably furthest along uh, potentially is the Novavax. Uh, we're pleased that we'll be able to start uh, the phase three trial with that here on our own campus, uh, hopefully here in coming days. And then another traditional approach to vaccination is with inactivated or attenuated virus. This is where uh, you have uh, the whole virus itself that's either killed or attenuated, meaning that it's weakened, and that you use that to uh, induce an immunologic response. And in general, uh, the way I like to think about vaccinations is that uh, your immune system is uh, like a guard that you have posted outside your home or your place of business. And uh, that guard is there to keep people out who, uh, who don't belong. And uh, you offer that guard a sidearm, but it's not loaded and they haven't had a whole lot of target practice. And so uh, that's your normal state. And so if an intruder comes in, uh, the guard recognizes the intruder, loads the weapon and then uh, repels the intruder, but it takes a little bit of time and effort. Now, when you immunize somebody, what you're doing is you're now offering your guard a loaded weapon and you've also had them do a lot of target practicing. So they are educated, they're skilled, they do target practice, they have a weapon that's loaded. They're ready to respond very quickly to any sort of an intruder. And that's what we're really doing with vaccination is that we're just simply arming our guard and having them ready to mount a response um, when they see a, and detect an intruder. Now, the, the problems uh, sometimes that we encounter is with an immune system that's not working very well. So if we have an immunosuppressed patient, uh, they have a sleepy guard. So they have a guard that's fallen asleep on the job and uh, the intruder is able to sneak by uh, undetected. And then the other opposite is if you have uh, people with an autoimmune disease where your guard is kind of jumpy. 
And unfortunately, uh, they're shooting at every shadow in the night, uh, sometimes uh, hitting an intruder and sometimes uh, having unintended uh, targets that are hit. So that's kind of how I like to think about this whole process of uh, uh, offering people vaccines, is we're simply training our guards. Uh, we're offering them a, a loaded weapon so that they can respond quickly. Now, uh, the real question that we have is which of these uh, vaccines is going to be the most effective? And the, quite frankly, the answer to that is unknown. Uh, it may depend upon the composition of the vaccine, whether it's a, an RNA vaccine that we have now coming out with emergency use authorization, or is it one of the other forms that I uh, related to you, um, a protein or an activated virus? Um, you know, is it going to depend upon the vector that has been used uh, to deliver? Uh, the vaccine product, uh, what route is going to be the best? Uh, is that an intramuscular injection or perhaps uh, we'll have uh, intranasal uh, vaccines that spare people uh, an injection? And uh, will we have a vaccine that will be able to uh, mount a response with just a single dose or are all of them going to be uh, needing a booster dose? And those are some of the things that are going to determine uh, which of these vaccines ends up being the most useful for us uh, going forward. Obviously, a lot still remains defined, uh, to be defined, although we know a lot. Um, you know, we, we still have some existing questions. One of the chief questions is, will these vaccines that we're currently rolling out uh, actually protect people from acquisition of the virus and potentially shedding uh, when they are asymptomatic? Uh, we know that they protect against uh, disease and they're about 95% effective in pre preventing illness. But do they also prevent people from just acquiring the virus and potentially shedding it? Uh, will they work in all groups uh, the same? So if we have immunosuppressed patients or we have uh, very elderly patients, uh, are they going to work uh, the same as they do in younger people? Um, what's the duration of protection? We don't know that. We have several months of experience now, but we don't have years of experience. And that's one of the questions that will need to be looked at. And if uh, the, the vaccine uh, effect uh, does wane, uh, when would a booster be most appropriate? So these are some of the things that, uh, again, need to be looked at. Um, you know, we, we do know very nicely that we don't see immediate uh, adverse events from the vaccine. And that's with, you know, just a few months of experience. But um, we've not studied this in millions of people. And so it's possible that we will see rare uh, side effects or toxicity that only come out after we've been using it in millions of persons and then we'll be able to detect some of those uh, potentially rare side effects or toxicity. Now I'd like to concentrate a little bit more on the mRNA vaccines because those are obviously the ones that are uh, being brought to market now and are starting to be used in our population and they're, they're new. So again, this is not a new technology. We've known about this for a number of decades, but uh, this is the first time that it's been put into a vaccine that has a uh, broad uh, application and is being used uh, broadly in our population. So uh, this just shows that the mRNA is enclosed in a, a lipid nanoparticle. And the mRNA is just really the information. Uh, it's really just a set of instructions that um, are, are given to your cell in order to make a protein. And so this mRNA is the instructions to make a bit of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And then the spike protein is produced by your cells, and then it is um, uh, released and detected by your immune system that then mounts an immunologic response and forms antibody to that spike protein. So again, this is giving your guard a loaded pistol now so that they can respond. If they ever see the SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 virus, they're able to respond very, very quickly. They're primed and they're ready. And then this shows this uh, process in just a little bit greater detail. So uh, not only do we have what's known as humoral immunity, or in other words, the production of antibodies to the spike protein, but we're also very hopeful that the spike protein is taken up by the antigen presenting cells, and they present that to T4 cells and, and CD8 cells, uh, CD4 and CD8 cells, so that we're able to have memory formed. And this could be potentially long lasting memory so that we don't have to give boosters quite frequently. And that's the hope with this. We actually think that we're gonna be able to do a better job with these vaccines than mother nature is doing uh, with the uh, exposure to the, the coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we're very hopeful that we'll have long lasting immunity, but that's one of the questions that you know, needs to be answered. 
So a, a little bit more about these mRNA um, COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, one thing is that the mRNA is very sensitive to environmental degradation. And that's one of the reasons why they have to be kept at very low temperatures. The Pfizer vaccine has to be maintained at a minus 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The Moderna vaccine can be kept at uh, normal freezer temperatures. But either one of these vaccines, once they become thawed, they have a very limited uh, shelf life. Uh, so it's just measured in a number of hours uh, that you have uh, time to get them thawed and put into the syringes and then need to be administered uh, to patients. Uh, this just demonstrates how fragile they are. And um, you know, this is uh, again, a plus and a minus. Uh, one of the things that I hear a lot about is how the mRNA is somehow gonna get inculcated into your genome. And the problem is with that is that, uh, again, they're very, very fragile. They're degraded by the en enzymes that they find uh, in, the, in the extracellular environment. Um, uh, this is something that we really don't have to worry about. And we'll go into that in just a little bit more in, in detail in, in just a few minutes. Uh, both of these vaccines require two injections, the Pfizer vaccine at three weeks, the Moderna vaccine at 28 days. Uh, both vaccines are about 95% effective in preventing clinical illness. And I'll show you a little bit of that data here in just a moment. Uh, both vaccines are associated with a fair number of people having uh, relatively mild, self-limited side effects and some uh, local toxicity. About 80% of people will have a sore arm. And so I think people do need to go into that knowing that uh, most folks will, will get a little bit of soreness at the injection site. Um, that's perfectly understandable when you, you know, inject a, a vaccine into your arm that uh, that's going to uh, result in some uh, soreness. About 40 to 50% of people who receive the vaccine have some other associated side effects, and we'll, I'll enumerate those in just a moment, and those tend to be more severe with the second dose. Now, this is the efficacy data or the effectiveness data uh, that was uh, published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is with the Pfizer vaccine, but the Moderna vaccine has nearly identical uh, results. They both come in at about 95% uh, efficacy. And what you can see here is what we call a Kaplan-Meier curve showing the, uh, the number of events over time. The blue line are the um, over 20,000 people who received the placebo injection. And the red line are the people who received the active component of the vaccine. So this was a really well done study. It was blinded, randomized, uh, placebo controlled. So the, the folks who got the vaccine didn't know what they had received. The people giving the vaccine didn't know how the, what they had received. And uh, then they were followed out very carefully over several months to see uh, who developed uh, clinical il illness. What you can see is that uh, in the placebo con uh, control group, there were 172 cases of clinically evident COVID-19 where there was only nine in the vaccine group equating to about a 95% effectiveness. And you can see that the lines really start to diverge right about 10 days to two weeks after that first injection. Um, and so, you know, we're optimistic that even with a first injection, you do receive a lot of protection. Uh, it's with the second injection that we think that that protection is going to actually be even longer lived. Uh, you can see that on December 11th, we received the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer vaccine, and that on the 18th, uh, we received the similar emergency use, use authorization from the FDA for the Moderna vaccine. Now, uh, people do need to go into this vaccination process with eyes wide open. We want to be very, very transparent about the information and what uh, uh, persons uh, are likely to experience. On the left-hand side of this slide are the local reactions, the pain, the redness, and the swelling that people had. And you can see that there's two columns for each of these categories. The left column is the uh, vaccine recipients. The right column is the placebo recipients. And so you can see again that you know, nearly 80% of people have some degree of pain. Green is mild, blue is uh, moderate, and then the orange and red are, are more severe. Uh, you can see very, very few people had severe uh, pain at the injection site. Uh, most of it was mild. Most of it went away within a day or two. Uh, very few people had redness or swelling. Now, systemic events are shown on the right-hand side of the slide, and these are fever on the far left side, followed by fatigue, headache, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, 
muscle pain, joint pain, and the use of antipyretics, meaning uh, Motrin or, or Tylenol. And you can see that uh, uh, fever is relatively uncommon, um, you know, mostly mild or moderate, that fatigue and headache is pretty common. And you can see that in the placebo recipients, uh, about a quarter of them had those same symptoms. About half of the vaccine recipients uh, had uh, fatigue and headache. Chills uh, also being present with the vaccine. Uh, very little in the way of vomiting or diarrhea. Muscle pain was more prevalent and some joint pain. And then the use of pyretics, you can see likewise uh, favored uh, the vaccine recipients taking that more frequently than the people who had received placebo. Again, these are mild to moderate in the vast majority of people. And when you compare that to the real downside of getting COVID-19, where you have a substantial uh, death rate, where you have a substantial possibility of entering into the hospital, having uh, the complications from COVID-19, potentially having the long-term um, complications and sequelae, what we're calling now the long haulers, um, the benefit for getting this vaccine, I think, clearly outweighs the risk of having these mild to moderate self-limiting uh, side effects. Now, the uh, CDC and the advisory committee and the FDA have thought long and hard about what's the best way to roll these vaccines out to our population. Uh, the CDC has come up with really what are the ethical principles around vaccine distribution. And they uh, uh, firmly believe, and I agree, that we need to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms of COVID-19 and the vaccine as given to uh, uh, protect people. We want to mitigate health inequalities. We want to promote justice and promote transparency. If the supply is limited, which it is, uh, we're only having a few million doses now coming out, we uh, want to give this to our first-line healthcare providers who are working in our emergency departments and with our COVID patients. And then we want to quickly get this also into the residents of long-term care facilities where the uh, outcome with COVID-19 has been just so overwhelming. We also want to make sure that we get the vaccine fairly quickly out to uh, people at highest risk. So uh, as you know, or probably know, this is being prioritized for people who are over the age of 75 and then those with pre-existing conditions that are going to make them at high risk for progression to severe disease. And we also wanna protect our essential workers. Uh, these would be uh, you know, our fire protection, police, uh, some of the first responders that uh, may not be in with the, the first wave of healthcare providers, um, you know, people who work in critical infrastructure jobs throughout our society. So this is where we really wanna roll it out and uh, make the most impact. Now, what I'd like to do next is just go over a few common questions and concerns about the mRNA vaccines and try to dispel uh, some of the reservation. So uh, one question that people often ask is whether the preservatives or chemicals in vaccines are harmful. And the first thing I would relate is that the mRNA vaccines uh, don't have any preservatives in them. That's one of the reasons why we have to keep them frozen uh, because they don't have these preservatives. So you can completely dissuade people of any kind of fear that they might have from the mercury or thimerosal that sometimes is, has been in vaccines in the past that we just don't have any preservatives in the mRNA vaccines. And so it's just not an issue. Now, people do continue to, to voice concerns about thimerosal, uh, which is a preservative that we used to have in, in vaccines. It was actually removed from almost all of our vaccines in 2001. Uh, just to, again, uh, take that off the table uh, because we don't necessarily need that specific preservative in the vaccine. And so currently, uh, most of the vaccines that we give in this country have no thimerosal, do not have a preservative in, in them, and uh, you know, that's just not an issue. Uh, about the only place where we continue to use uh, preservatives in our vaccines is with the multi-dose vials of influenza vaccine. Uh, most people get a flu vaccine with a single injection, uh, which again, does not have a preservative. Uh, people also ask about adjuvants. If you remember, these are the chemicals that we put into the vaccine in order to boost the immunologic response. Uh, they've been used for decades. Uh, we've not seen any adverse events that we can really um, uh, link to the adjuvants. 
Uh, the most common uh, ingredient in the adjuvant is aluminum. And uh, again, people say, gee, how can that be helpful? Uh, and they just don't recognize that aluminum is one of the most common metals that we find in nature and that uh, we get exposed to it every day in our food and in our drink. And then um, uh, I'm sure that uh, Alice can comment on this more intelligently than I can, but uh, even in breast milk, you find aluminum and that infants get exposed to more aluminum in breast milk than they would in any of the vaccines that they, uh, they may get administered. And then there is sometimes in other vaccines, small amounts of other ingredients that uh, you know, keep them safe and keep them effective and have not been shown to, to have a concern. Now, um, one of the other um, reservations that's being expressed is that the mRNA vaccines have been uh, associated with serious adverse events in the form of serious allergic reactions. Now, we didn't see serious allergic reactions in the clinical trials uh, with the vaccine. There have been some anecdotal, well-publicized cases of people having serious allergic reactions in the rollout of these vaccines. There were two cases in the uh, UK that clearly uh, were, were uh, heavily uh, uh, publicized. Likewise, there was a, a case in Alaska where somebody was actually on camera and then had some sort of a vagal effect after receiving the, uh, the vaccine. Um, we don't really know, um, you know what is triggering these things and we need to watch very carefully. So uh, again, uh, there is an adverse event reporting system that is, is very alive and well as we roll out this vaccine, we're very quickly going to be able to get some information on how often we're seeing serious uh, allergic reactions. Currently, the only real um, contraindication to receiving the MRA, mRNA vaccine is if you are allergic to an actual component of the vaccine. And about the only component that people need to be aware of is a chemical called polyethylene glycol. Uh, polyethylene glycol or PEG is uh, in some laxatives. And so some of the over-the-counter laxatives like uh, 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 Miralax actually have some polyethylene glycol. And so if patients are allergic to that, they should not get the vaccine. And then what we're telling people is that if they've had a serious allergic reaction to other medications or injectables, we want to watch them very, very carefully after we give the vaccine. And so we're requiring our healthcare providers to remain uh, at our vaccine clinic for 30 minutes after they get the vaccine and to watch them very, very carefully. Um, we're not really saying that people who have food allergies, uh, so if you have an egg allergy or a peanut allergy or you have seasonal allergies, uh, that they have to, uh, to be uh, terribly concerned about this vaccine. We've not seen a link uh, between those people and allergic reactions. Um, should the mRNA vaccine be given to pregnant women? So we've not studied this vaccine in pregnant women, but all the information that we have to date is fairly uh, reassuring. So in the animal studies that uh, we look for toxicity and, and reproductive effects have been reassuring. Uh, there's no real reason to think that this vaccine will have ill effects for a pregnant woman or her developing child. And therefore, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine have actually recommended that the vaccine be made available to women who are pregnant um, and that they should carefully consider uh, getting the vaccine. So they want to be in uh, you know, counsel with their physicians and it should be made available to them if they wish to get the vaccine. What we clearly know is that women who are pregnant and get COVID-19 do have an increased uh, uh, possibility of having um, a serious illness. Um, and so we want to make sure that uh, if, they, if they want to get the vaccine to protect against that, that it would be available to them. Um, there were some pregnant women uh, in the vaccine trials. Uh, they actually became pregnant after the, the first dose of the vaccine. Those women are being watched very, very carefully. Obviously, their pregnancies have not come to term at this point, uh, but they're being watched very, very carefully. And there's also a registry uh, that is active for women who are either pregnant and get the vaccine or become pregnant after receiving the vaccine so that we'll be able to gather information on this. Should the mRNA vaccine be given to immune compromised persons? Uh, please realize this is not a live virus vaccine. And so we think that this will be safe for immunosuppressed patients, 
the only real question is whether immunosuppressed patients will react to the vaccine. So will they get the benefit from the vaccine uh, as much as people who are immunocompetent? Uh, does the mRNA vaccine cause female sterility? Um, I've been asked this question a lot, and quite frankly, it, it's kind of a, a question out of left field. It's based upon some very um, hypothetical kind of situations, and there's really just no data to suggest that this vaccine is going to be detrimental uh, to women. Uh, clearly, as I mentioned to you, there were some that became pregnant while receiving uh, the vaccine. And so this would speak to the fact that, um, you know, it's not likely to, to cause any problems with sterility. And then the other thing I would bring up is if the vaccine does cause problems, uh, it's much more likely that those problems would be seen with actual COVID-19 infection uh, rather than with the vaccine. And so it might be, a, a, you know, another reason to get vaccinated. Should the mRNA vaccine be given to pediatric age persons? I'm going to let uh, Alice um, uh, go through this, and um, uh, I'll turn it over to her to address that uh, specific topic. Hi there. Um, so the uh, two different vaccines have uh, dif a difference in their EUA, and that was based on the amount of information that they had. So for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, they did have some 16 and 17-year-olds in their data set at the time they applied for the EUA. Moderna had not started enrolling children, so they did not. So um, they, Pfizer was able to ask to have 16 and 17 year olds included. And if you look at the advisory council's vote prior to uh, the FDA's decision on the EUA, where a discussion was had by many leaders in pediatric infectious disease, as well as other members of that council, the concern was that the amount of data that we had so far collected in these older teenagers was less than what we had for other age groups. Uh, so uh, one person who's spoken to this directly is Archana Chatterjee, who used to be here. Um, so you may uh, know Dr. Chatterjee. And her opinion was that she felt it was important to get a little bit more data in children um, before using it, but she was fully in support and is um, on record saying she was fully in support in the vaccine for people 18 and up. So the only question in her mind was that small uh, piece of information. Uh, that said, um, there are other members who made the point that uh, particularly in more rural areas and depending on the situation, we are certainly going to have 16 and 17 year olds who might be working as a healthcare worker or might be uh, working in a clinical lab or they might be uh, with a high risk condition in a long term care facility that would benefit from having the option to get this vaccine. There still needs to be parental approval for them to get it. And they would still have to be in a category of person who would be prioritized to get that vaccine at the time they came in for it. So currently, they would have to be um, in a long-term care facility or uh, uh, considered a healthcare worker. So uh, the trials are enrolling now. Um, the same with the Novavax. Uh, their initial studies did not include children, uh, but most of the forefront vaccines are looking at doing studies in children 12 and older now, and we're hoping to see that um, come down in age. Uh, it's certainly understandable at the time where they started these studies uh, with a less used vaccine that they weren't sure uh, was going to be a successful technology for a vaccine to uh, maybe not start with children and pregnant women. But now that we know that this vaccine is highly, highly effective uh, and uh, we don't have any signal to think that it's going to uh, be a problem, certainly for older children in terms of being able to mount an immune response to this and that we don't see a signal that makes us worried that they will be at increased risk from the vaccine itself. Um, that it's uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics is actually calling for inclusion of children in these trials. So we're certainly looking forward to that. It would be wonderful if we had enough information to at least vaccinate some of our older children prior to next school year. Uh, so if we had that available to us as a tool, 
that would be great for protecting children and their communities, for sure. Um, and I think I have another couple of slides, right? So uh, more information to come, obviously. Hopefully. So, and, and we'll get to the pediatric data in, in just a second, <laughs> Alice. So just a couple of other questions and concerns uh, that I've heard people express, and that is that fetal cells are contained in the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine. It's just simply not true. There are no fetal cells in the manufacture of these vaccines. Uh, people have also expressed a concern of whether the mRNA will result in viral genome integrating into their own uh, host genome. And again, this just uh, isn't true. Um, you know, again, the RNA will not enter into the nucleus and the vaccine doesn't contain all the machinery that's necessary to integrate uh, into the, the host genome. So this seems, uh, I think, to be pretty far-fetched and isn't a, a real concern. And then a lot of people also suggest that uh, isn't the natural infection better than getting the vaccine itself? I've already covered this a little bit that we think we can do a better job than mother nature with actually having long lasting immunity. And clearly natural infection is, it can be horrendous, uh, can result in death or permanent disability um, and lots of long-term sequelae. So uh, again, clearly the benefit of getting the vaccine outweighs the real risk of having a natural infection. And then again, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sato to just go over a little bit of the pediatric data. And again, why we're also concerned about kids uh, with COVID-19. So I just wanted to share some of the national data with you um, and then a little bit of our local data in terms of the effects on children. Early on, there was a lot of thought that maybe children had fewer receptors in their airway passages maybe they were less likely to get infected um, and uh, less likely to get sick or die from this infection. But what we have learned over the subsequent months is that it is still a very important infection in children. Um, children can be infected. Children can infect others, other children or grownups, um, and they can become severely ill or die. So the American Academy of PDA Pediatrics, in conjunction with the Children's Hospital Association, collect, compiles data, and they have been issuing a weekly report that you can find uh, openly available on their website. And as of their most recent report, which collected data through 1217, there were over 1.8 million cases of infection confirmed in children. Uh, and that's almost certainly an undercounting of children because when children are more likely to be asymptomatic with their infection, they may not always get tested or they could be the sibling of a known case and they just don't get tested because it's assumed that if their sibling's infected and they're sick or their parents infected and they're sick, they may not also get tested. This uh, number of proven cases is equal to uh, 2,420 cases per 100,000 children. So that's, um, reasonably large number in uh, children. Uh, at the beginning, we only saw a few percentage of the cases that we diagnosed as occurring in children. But through the summer into the fall, we have seen the percentage of cases that are in children and young adults increasing. Uh, probably children just weren't exposed at the beginning, especially when in March when everybody went home. Um, children just weren't exposed to people who had traveled to Asia as much or to Europe as much. Uh, as grownups who are traveling. Uh, the hospitalization rate for children is much less than for adults. So children who are infected have a hospitalization rate around 1.3%. Um, and for not all the data that uh, is collected by the AAP and Children's Hospital Association uh, is uh, separated by age in a way that we can tell. So uh, when they look at the data they have, they are able to look at 42 states plus New York City, separate from New York State, uh, and there's confirmed 172 pediatric deaths, and there's always a delay in terms of confirming deaths. Um, you may have known from the news report that we had a death, uh, pediatric death at UNMC, and it was actually a few months later that uh, it was officially confirmed, so there can definitely be a lag. And I just want to compare that to flu. Um, if you look at adult data, uh, the number of deaths in an average flu season over the last 10 years is about 36,000. And we will certainly reach 
360,000 deaths uh, from coronavirus. So we're seeing many, many, many more cases, many, many more deaths. And if you go and you compare, if you take all deaths uh, that have pneumonia, influenza, or coronavirus uh, on there, we see that the numbers are much higher than our usual uh, rates of death. So it's not just that we're counting everything as COVID. Um, and if you look at the worst flu seasons recently, which were 2018 and 2019 in terms of pediatric deaths, we had 114 and 188,000, uh, sorry, 114 and 188 deaths in those flu seasons. And we already have 172 confirmed COVID deaths in pediatrics. We also have a Another syndrome from this infection that we see in children, it's also seen in a few adults, but it was recognized because it's uh, much more a pediatric complication of this disease called MISC or MISC, which stands for multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, where they come in with fever and usually um, GI involvement and heart involvement, and these children can be very sick. Uh, so far, the CDC tracking has confirmed about 1,300 cases but they're still reviewing cases. They're actually a couple months behind in terms of trying to get up to date on all the data. And since uh, the case counts has increased over time, um, we're expecting that to increase, but we've also seen another 23 deaths from MISC. So the combination of pediatric COVID and MISC deaths is higher than uh, flu season, even though children are for certain less affected by this disease than adults have been. And, yep. And so this slide um, is just a nice graphic that uh, I think really helped us appreciate very early on. If you just sit back and look, that blue wave going through is um, tracking of coronavirus or COVID cases. And what happened after we saw these initial waves and it's been replicated in different countries and different states and different cities and even in our own data, you see that blue wave of coronavirus infections come through. And then a few weeks later, we start to see these children with this MISC, this new syndrome, where they present and they come in. And if you go to my last slide, I think I have. Um, in Nebraska, we've seen that same thing. So um, we, uh, as a hospital, have worked reported 27 children now to the health department as what we believe uh, may be MISC. Um, since we have continued to follow these children very closely, I would say a handful of them, I'm not certain at this point had MISC because we've come up with alternative diagnoses, but this is how our reporting has looked. We had a peak back in June that followed the peak of coronavirus and COVID in, uh, in the state that was more around May. Uh, in the spring, and now our second wave, so you just saw our hospitalizations peak in mid-November, we're now seeing additional children with this MISC. Um, of these 27 that we reported, nine of them required ICU care, mostly due to problems with their heart being inflamed, and um, we've seen all sorts of um, different types of changes in the heart, not just of the coronary arteries, but we've seen dysfunction and the squeezing and relaxation of the heart. We've seen little um, collections of extra fluid or inflammation around the heart. Uh, and uh, in fact, when I made the slide yesterday afternoon, um, Children's has uh, diagnosed another case of a child in the ICU with MISC and, a, and another child um, with severe COVID. So we're continuing to see these cases and children are not going to be being broadly immunized. So uh, we need to continue to try and protect children by masking, social distancing, all those, you know, avoiding congested areas and doing all those things that we can to prevent them from being infected so that they don't have the complications of this infection. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sato. I think that, uh, you know, everybody in the audience is, um, you know, really familiar with all the adverse events, uh, complications from COVID-19 uh, in adults and, um, you know, not so familiar with what's going on in kids. And obviously this is an important disease in our pediatric age patients. And so we're looking forward to hopefully having this vaccine available to them as well.
And I'd like to just close with this slide that, um, you know, again, reiterates that this uh, process of getting this vaccine, uh, when you look back on the, the fact that a year ago, we weren't even aware of this uh, disease, and now we're actually um, administering an effective vaccine to the population is, is pretty amazing. It really is a moonshot for medical science. 